David Healy runs rxrisk.org, which is a website that is dedicated to exploring the side effects of prescription medications. And our conversation with him is basically about what it means to prescribe pharmaceutical substances to people in the modern world. Are we actually serving people with the prescriptions? Are they doing the things that they promise that they're doing? What are the ways in which the system has been corrupted? Who's and driving the car? Yeah, because it's not entirely clear who's at control of the... Who, who's manning the controls with this operation. And so, and it was it was a it was a really interesting conversation. He's written a book called Shipwreck of the Singular. He's actually written many books. I think more than twenty books. We'll link uh, to a list of them down in the description. Uh, we think that you're really going to enjoy this. It is the very first conversation that we're having on the subject, which is basically pharma, health, and regulation. We'll have a lot more of them, and so we hope you stick around. Yeah, if you dig the podcast, share it with somebody, please. That's how we get better and better guests. So we really need you to, if you care, uh, just tell somebody and uh, maybe they'll enjoy it too. If you really love it, consider becoming a patron and you can actually come out to our weekly meetups and help us figure out where to go with everything next and really help us scale this project up. You know, we want to be able to do these podcasts live eventually. We need to build up some equipment to do that. We want to be able to take it on the road too and actually meet up with people on stage. So we got big plans and we could really use your help. So consider it. Just give a couple bucks a month and it really adds up over time and you're going to help it, help it happen, make it happen. Agreed. In the meantime, enjoy David Healy and we will see you next week. The scientific revolution starts now. So I see people who've got nervous problems, and it can be the full range of nervous problems that you could have. In uh, uh, the past, I've been dealing with people who've been in hospital who are uh, severely mentally ill, but at the moment, it's much more people who are going to you know, the family doctor, and uh, the family doctor is asking me, well, look, this person doesn't seem to be doing all that well on the treatment they're on. Can you have a look at them and see what else we could do, for instance? So that's about half of my week. And the other half is looking at issues about the history of medicine, randomized control trials and things like that, and trying to get a grip on some issues. There's some interesting issues that come up the whole time. Uh, in terms of clinical trials, or people being injured by the treatments, and they get in touch and work out what their options are. Mm. And this touches on a really big topic, which is that, okay, so if you are looking at something like mental disorders, and you approach treatment with a pharmacological lens, you have the opportunity to introduce a lot of side effects that far outweigh the benefits that you're going to get from the treatment. And the same is true in something like cancer. But with cancer, it's like it's very much a life or death question where, okay, so you're going to get this chemotherapy. The chemotherapy is going to damage you, but is it going to damage you less than the cancer? Is it going to buy you a few years? Like the 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 deal with the devil, so to speak, is is quite obvious there. But I think that people have this tendency of looking at pharmacological substances for mood disorders and brain stuff and be like, well, this is okay. Like, this will be fine. There's, you know, they're, they're relatively there's no safe. Here. There's no, there's no trade-offs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that the yeah. sense you get? Yes, it is. And there's probably a few quick things I can say to maybe open this up, uh, which is that, well, of course, Prozac, you know, looks like it's a chemotherapy for cancer can be useful. And that may be true of all of the SSRIs. And drugs like isotretinone for acne uh, began as a cancer treatment before they turned over to becoming a thing for a minor problem with skin. So, I mean, how could that cause a problem? But in actual fact, it was uh, introduced first to try and treat brain cancer. So, um, there's the other issue, which is the thing you mentioned, which most drugs have, well, they do hundreds of things. Uh, I used to say up till recently that they do a hundred things, but lately when people have been looking at what's called the epigenetic um, effects of drugs, like you, you take the drug and you see what happens to your genes and what proteins are being produced by the genes after you have the drug. And at the moment, there's a bunch of drugs out there that get used quite widely. Uh, 
which seem to produce upwards of 3,500 effects. Now, when you take a drug like Prozac or a drug for acne or a drug like um, maybe one of uh, uh, the drugs that are used to stabilize your moods, people think that's all it's doing. But it's not. In terms of the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor group of drugs, the SSRIs, of which Prozac is one, there's very little serotonin in our brains. Mm. Most of it is in our blood and our gut and our skin and things like that. Trouble is, the marketing is so good that people think these drugs go straight into your brain and fix the serotonin levels and don't do anything else. But that's just plain wrong. They mm. do lots of other things that may seriously impair you. Like in, in, in uh, the case of the SSRI group of drugs, what we're looking for is a change in your mood that might happen after you've been on these drugs for a month. And people look intensely at that. And they miss the fact that 30 minutes after you've had your first pill, almost everyone becomes genitally numb. Whoa! 30 and minutes? That endures. <laughs> 30 minutes after your first pill. That one didn't make it out of the commercial. Uh, no, it didn't. Genitally numb. Now, well, it did. It did in the sense that uh, you know, the companies did say in the label of the drug, you know, there's a small number of people, uh, you know, maybe one in 20, who will find that in terms of being able to make love, that things aren't quite right. Now, it's actually closer to 100%. Wow. Now, the other aspect to it is that people get told, but, you know, this is a problem that will clear up when you come off the drug. Uh, and even if you want to go away for a romantic weekend, you can hold your drug for the weekend and things will, will actually be fine. That's not right. And I had a lady that came to me a long time ago, and I can still see her because it was one of those things that was very dramatic. You know, you've got this very attractive woman wearing a green cardigan, which I can still see, and she had red hair, and you know, the contrast between the green and the red was really good. And she said to me, look, you know, I'm on an SSRI. Well, no, she said, I've been on an SSRI, and I'm having problems making love. And I said, yes, yes, this is well known. It's the kind of thing that will go once you're off the drug, and maybe if you're going away for the weekend, you can hold your drug. And she looked at me and said, I have been off this drug for three months. And I can take a hard bristled brush Aww. and rub it up and down my <laughs> genitals and feel nothing. Whoa. Now, it turns out that before these drugs came on the market, when the companies gave them to healthy volunteers, which is part of what they have to do before they bring it on the market to treat people, they knew this could happen. So back in the 1980s, they knew this problem could happen. And, uh, you know, at the moment I'm in, contact with over a thousand people who after they hold the drug years sometimes decades later still cannot make love and it's men and women it's young people and old people and it's every ethnic group on earth on earth and and, and there's been all these headlines lately too about these things just aren't really working like they promised to be I, I can't recall one specifically but i feel like it's just been cropping up like these the promise of of tinkering with a single molecule in the brain has really not proven out. Yeah, no, you're right. And again, um, I had a, an inside kind of position on this during the 1980s. I was working on serotonin reuptake. So the companies uh, brought their drugs, which weren't then on the market to me. And it was, it was clear that they were involved in a number of clinical trials. And when they compared their the SSRI group of drugs with the older group of drugs, the tricyclic antidepressants, the older group of drugs always won. Now, if you have an older group of drugs that beats yours, and if you want to make money out of it, the older group of, group of drugs are going to be much cheaper. How are you going to make money? Okay. And at one point, there, there was most of the companies were wondering, is at any point trying to bring these on the market? But they were told by the marketing departments, oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely no problem. Bring it on the market. We can sell these. We can persuade people these are miracle drugs that they work wonderfully well. There's not, as far as I know, a single trial of an SSRI which proves that it works for people who are severely depressed. And the companies didn't want them to work for that because that's pretty rare. Very few people get very severely depressed. What they wanted them to work for was to replace the benzodiazepines for the 
relatively minor, it's a little bit unfortunate to call them minor, but for the everyday nervous problems we all have, the, you know, there's always a point during the month or whatever when we're feeling brittle or anxious. Or well, the world is falling nice apart, you know. It kind of yeah, well, stresses well, yes. people out. <laughs> in the face of the world falling apart. I think um, that in the book you mentioned that there's a test that uh, that it was like a codeine dependency test where you can give dexo dexomorphin to see if the depression resolves and if it does that's what differentiates major depressive disorder versus something that's like anxiety or yeah. nervousness related yes yes and um the um yeah the, there was a thing called the dexamethasone uh, uh suppression test which which clearly picks out the people who you, if you know they're obviously fairly ill, they're likely to end up in hospital. The older antidepressants help them, and electroconvulsive therapy can also help. But the SSRIs and other drugs like that just don't. Which brings out a point: the SSRIs are rather like stimulants, are hmm. benzodiazepines, are drugs like that, which could all be marketed as antidepressants, and even alcohol could. You know, you could put alcohol into the kinds of trials the SSRIs were put into and get the same result as you have for the SSRIs. And if you're a good... Bring back day drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go a little bit further. It's not just bring back day drinking. Maybe bring back smoking. Because for OCD, which is one of the conditions that the SSRIs are used for, nicotine produces just as good results in controlled trials. You know, so... Mm. Yeah, it's like, it's quite a neurotrop neurotropic actually. We um we actually eat nicotine as well. We 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 just buy nicotine. We don't smoke it, but mm -hmm. um it's it's a nice stimulant. We we take these little Altoids and you know put yeah. a little bit of nicotine on them. We're we're uh, we're so cheap that we won't actually buy the ones that are professionally made. So we oh, you buy can't afford those. No. Yeah, <laughs> so just, but you can buy nicotine. It's almost free, so <laughs> you can make your own. Um, not trying <laughs> kids, don't do it though. Whatever you do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is a powerful uh, nootropic. That's interesting, and alcohol mm -hmm. too. I hadn't thought about that. But these mm -hmm. things, these things are relatively cheap, and they have a social aspect to them, right? So, like smoking is something that if you if you kind of look at the sociology of smoking, people will often smoke in groups at parties. It's a thing that allows you to to engage with somebody for a brief moment. That it kind of lets you like step outside of the world. It's meditative in a sense. But mm -hmm. it's obviously bad for you. And mm -hmm. so you you get rid of one thing, but if you try to replace it with a psychotropic chemical that is promised to be a miracle drug, the likelihood it is, is that it's not going to be... It might not be as... I think that the difficulty is that it's hard to tell that it is directly harmful the same way that you could tell that cigarettes are harmful, right? Because there's... Well well, there is. Uh, let me just pick up on that, which is alcohol, which you all know is harmful, and nicotine, which you all know is harmful, are available over the counter. Prescription drugs you have to get from a person like me because we figured they are more harmful than alcohol and nicotine. And the other aspect to it is everybody knows if you take alcohol and nicotine every day of the week for the next 10, 20, 30 years, they're going to shorten your life. The In nicotine the you think will shorten my life? Yeah, by itself, the nicotine without smoking. Well, possibly that's one, that's a good question. Um, my hunch is all things been equal. The human body is can cope awfully well with being poisoned for a good cause. <laughs> like if you're taking an an antibiotic for a few weeks to get over a problem, these drugs are pretty toxic, but the body copes with them. Mm -hmm. What the human body is not designed to cope with is taking things every day of the week, every day of the year. And not just one, but taking a few of them. And increasingly, people from their teens up are, aren't just on one or two drugs. They're on four or five, or eight or nine of these. And, you know, when you look at people that kind of smoke, uh, you recognize that their hair goes gray quicker and all sorts of things go wrong. In, in uh, the same way, um, if you're on a bunch of prescription drugs the whole time, you are going to die earlier. And life expectancy in the United States in particular you guys are leading the world, as you do with most things. Uh, Straight to the bottom falling, of the world. <laughs> has, has been falling since before COVID. And uh, my hunch is that, that that polypharmacy plays a major role in all this. Well, there's got to be a saturation point, right? I mean, the... the 
one of the things that's difficult about your about shipwreck is how many things are at play all at once. And so it's hard to draw a clear story from it because you said something interesting, which is that the drugs were chosen to be prescribed by a physician because they're deemed to be dangerous. But at the same point, they're also there's a gilding process, of this, right? Because the minute that you allow everybody to buy prescription drugs over the counter, then you destroy the entire industry to some degree, right? Because if the only reason that you need the doctor is to, to for, for what? If they're not giving you drugs? Like, that's the, that's well, the model of the doctor at this point. The, no, the model of the doctor at this point is they keep you on drugs. SSRIs are very like antihistamines. If you buy an antihistamine over the counter, I mean, in fact, most of the antihistamines are SSRIs. Hmm. If you buy an antihistamine over the counter and have a bad reaction to it, you aren't going to keep taking it. If you get your SSRI from me and I tell you it takes a few weeks to work and you may may not feel all that good for a while uh, while you're on them, um, you know, you're, you're, you're trapped because you figure you're not feeling good. I'm your get out of jail free card. I'm the way out of the problem. And if you make me angry or irritated that I'm not going to help you when you really need help, so you do as you're told, mm. okay? Which is highly dangerous. And Medicine as well. I mean, it's something, you know, it's the fact that we make a living out of these drugs that means somehow we, we, we kind of see them as fitting in with our good intentions, our desire to help you. So if you're not being helped and our intentions are good and everybody says the drug works, works wonders and you get worse, what we see is your illness getting worse when in fact it's probably we're poisoning you and what we need to do is stop poisoning you instead we double the dose of the pills and we make your your kind of condition uh, the one you didn't really have to begin with becomes chronic what are you say? i was just gonna say this is a wild perspective for a doctor to have so like when did you no it's not no okay it's, so you went into medicine be... realizing this no no well no no you <laughs> see i'm <laughs> that's I'm... what i mean just yeah no no i'm ancient i'm old enough to remember the 20th century okay mm. and the fact that medicines i mean some of the most famous kind of phrases about medicine is their poisons and the art of medicine is bringing good out of the use of a poison. But you've got to, I mean, if you're actually going to do that, you've got to remember that you're using a poison. I've got to let you know as well that you're about to take a poison. And we both need to be mm. keeping an eye to make sure that the good we're hoping to get out of this is actually happening and that you're not being poisoned rather than helped. So people you think but, were more upfront about that in the past? I mean, I guess people were oh, putting yes. leeches on each other's faces and bleeding one another, and it was kind of obvious that medicine was this sort of trade. No, no, no. Well, yes, but no, it was more during the 1950s, 1960s, when we got a bunch of new drugs, which really, for the first time, really did help. People still recognized that they could cause problems, okay? Now, there's a few things that are playing a part here. One is, since about maybe 1990, maybe uh, to thousand, the medicines we used have become sacramental in the sense of they can only do good. It's a bit like having the Eucharist. It's going to save you. You're going to go to heaven and nothing is going to happen to you. Nothing bad. But, you know, the Catholic Church now even recognized that if there's gluten in the Eucharist they give you, Eucharist that they give you, that, you know, you can be harmed by it. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies will not concede that their drugs cause any harms at all. And the literature that they write hypes up the good things and hides the harms. And this gets built into the guidelines. And the people who manage mental health services who are not doctors these days don't want doctors to start saying, look, I'm giving poisons and trying to bring good out of the use of poison. That doesn't compute for management, our insurers, our, our politicians, mm. or even Greta Thunberg's generation generally. They're very worried about the chemicals we're pumping into the outer environment, but mm. they're pumping loads of chemicals into the inner environment. Well, they're actually, only worried about, they're actually only worried about one chemical, which is the most annoying part of the whole argument. Um, mm. that, that is, wow, that is really, you mentioned, you said it, they don't acknowledge that it does any harm. 
And I think what you're trying to say is that they call the harm like side effects, like, oh, these little things, like they might, but in reality, you're saying that the, the damage is part of the therapy. It's, it's inherent in the process, essentially. Well, not um, at a damage to my, well, yes, you could put it like that, but certainly the chances that you're going to be damaged. And, you know, when it comes to cancer chemotherapy, people recognize this, doctors recognize it still. You know, we're in the business of trying to poison you, hoping that the tumor is going to be more poisoned than you are. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's what's recognized reasonably clearly. But yes, the point that uh, we opened up with was, but can this be true of the drugs we use for nerves and for our skin and this, that, and the other? Well, the answer is, yes, it can. Is it because harm is such a precarious term? Like, it's very ill-defined and nebulous, and you can squish out from underneath the word harm? You know, when when somebody gets uh, a toxicity that kills them, that's easy to quantify and keep a metric of. But if someone is just, you know, not feeling well, or they're not feeling as perky in the sack as they used to or something, this is maybe a more difficult... Or it might also just be easier to, to... squirm out of essentially well there's a few things one is that uh, the industry has uh, discovered randomized controlled trials and one thing about that is the trials um you know what they say is these prove cause and effect which they don't but what they say is well we know this drug is causing that if it's if it's happening to a statistically significant extent now if you're focused in on does Prozac cause uh, people's mood to lift, you've got to look awfully hard. You've got to train your eye on it and keep asking questions and things like that to find any evidence that it does. And because of that, you miss things that are happening, um, you know, like the fact that you take a pill and you become gently numb after just one pill. Things like that get missed. A whole load of other things get missed. And the trial at the end of the day just shows one statistically significant thing, which is the effect on your mood. Other things aren't being collected in a way that would let you say, well, actually, yes, these are statistically significant also. And the industry say quite openly, under oath, in court, Our drugs don't cause any side effects. Nothing has been proven. You know, things happen to you while you're on our drug. You know, your skin. Which drugs are these? They say have no side effects. Sorry, I've never heard such a thing. That's crazy. Yes, like like acids, like Prozac and stuff. Yes, they're saying they have no side effects. No proven things. What I mean, what they say is, things happen to you on the drug. Of course, things happen to you every day of the week. Your skin may get blotchy. You may be on Prozac and your skin gets blotchy. But saying that because you're on Prozac and your skin's become blotchy, the Prozac has caused it. Well, that's anecdotal. There's no evidence that it's happening. I mean, you see this uh, all over the internet, which is really interesting to me, where uh, women that are on birth control, uh, people that are on SSRIs or various other drugs, you will stumble into areas where they spend time together talking about what they think the drugs have done to them. And the collection of symptoms that they ascribe to the drugs is radically different from the things that are printed on the side of the bottle. Because if you go and you look at, like, you know, the the list of uh, common or serious side effects from Prozac on Google, it's like insomnia, headache, drowsiness, anxiety, nausea, sexual problems, higher risk of bleeding, and antidepressant discontinuation syndrome. But there's nothing like... Whatever that is. I think that that's when you stop taking the Prozac, you you have some kind of refractory depression and it gets worse. With withdrawal of some sort? Yeah, I think that it's like withdrawal from Prozac. But they don't talk about, uh, like you mentioned in your book, this anecdote of a woman who starts taking SSRIs and then develops a drinking problem and then has to deal with the fact that everybody thinks that she's an alcoholic, but she's like, I don't think I'm an alcoholic. And then when she comes off the drugs or she starts taking a drug that doesn't have the SSRI mechanism, then it turns around. So it's like, there's definitely things that are written on the pill bottle, but they are not the the full extent of what is happening to people. And the full extent is the thing that's easy to point to because they're not the common side. Like if you had a clinical trial and every single person in that trial developed a drinking problem, that would be harder, I think, to 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 look away from than if you have, I don't know, one percent of people who develop a drinking problem. 
And so I, I think that a lot of the effects get hidden that way, where it's things that seem like they can't be related. It's like the, this happened with the, with the Parkinson's drugs, right? The dopaminergic drugs that mm -hmm. they were giving for Parkinson's. They were also prescribing them for restless leg syndrome. And it turned out that it made people into gambling addicts because it triggered something in the dopamine system. And it took a really long time for that to be figured out. But now you go to PubMed and there are papers where people are talking about it. But I would bet that the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies are still trying to sell them as hard as they ever were before. Yeah. In um, uh, the case of the anti-Parkinson's pills, um, the reason the problems came to light reasonably quickly is you've got to be an older man usually to get Parkinson's, and you might be a lawyer or a judge in court. And if you get involved in prostitution and gambling and things like that if you become disinhibited by the pill then you know uh, the system is going to say oh he's a decent guy and you know it must have been the pill that caused it so that helped it to come to light if you're a woman in particular and younger you know you're going to be uh, not given that kind of benefit people are not going to believe you in the same way but this raises the question about where does objectivity come from and what industry like to say, it comes from control trials. It comes from doing things in this very pure way where we have two groups of people, one on the pill and one not on the pill, and they're randomized and they don't know which they're on. And we can work out what the pill is really doing because of this. But in the course of doing that, for instance, you see, people are, you and I, if you're in the trial as a volunteer, and if I'm one of the investigators, we're both told to suspend our judgment. And if I'm trying to rate you for being depressed today, there's a rating scale, and I've got to ask you a bunch of questions. I'm going to ask you, are you this week more suicidal than you were last week? Okay, and if you say, yes, I am. Now, at that point, there's two things that could be causing this, which is, one is the pill you're on, in which case, the answer probably, sh uh, the score I should give you probably should be zero. If it's the condition causing it, the score could be three or four. But I'm not supposed to make a judgment. You know, the controlled trial is supposed to make the judgment. So I don't make the judgment. And there's a default into thinking everything that gets worse is because of your condition getting worse. Now, uh, so can, can, later, we, can we back up and talk about how these yeah. clinical trials are established? Like who's, because... You know, in order to achieve objectivity, if we think about it as objective, we imagine it being like this very uh, holy group of people that have no interests in what happens. And they're, you know, they're very, it's a very protected sacred space, but that's not really how it works. The, the trials aren't designed and conducted by third parties, or are they? And how does that work? No, they aren't. And um, you're right. And, but the key thing is that, um, the trial, and I'm going to tease this a part of it now, that the trial is, is its objective rather than we're objective. Okay. And it's just you adhere to the procedure and we will get the correct answer. Now, there's a problem here with all this. Clinical trials were introduced over 100 years ago. And, you know, it was a good idea to keep an eye on what happened to people. Test a new pill. And around the 1950s, people got the idea, well, we'll kind of blind you as, we'll blind the investigator as to what pill the person's on, but also we'll randomize you, okay, so that nobody could possibly guess what pill you're on in the sense of, you know, the investigator hands you out a pill and they don't know which of the two it is, you know, whether it's the placebo or the active pill. And they don't know the order. Like if it was just a case of, you know, the first person in gets the active pill, the next person gets placebo, the third person gets the active pill, you'd be able to guess what's going on. But, you know, it's not. It's jumbled up so no one really knows what's happening. And the idea was that this was uh, supposed to give us uh, an objective view about what the pill does. And then in 1962, we had the thalidomide the, the crisis. This is a sleeping pill that was being given to women and caused them, if they were taking it while pregnant, during the first three months while they were pregnant, their children were born without arms or legs or whatever. And, you know, it was a grim kind of picture. 
And um, that crisis caused people to say, well, look, you know, drugs can be awfully risky. They can be poisons, which could do harm. And there's a lot of them on the market that don't even work. So in order to make things a little bit more safe, we should use control trials to force companies to prove their drugs can do something good against which to offset the risks. Okay. But Amen. who's who's running these though? That's what I'm trying to say. Like who's ah, administering the, the operation? But but it isn't just that. Let me let okay, me okay. let me introduce a thing that's 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 a bit new. Um which is you know, the question you're asking, loads of people ask, if the pharmaceutical companies were the ones who run these trials, if they're the ones that run these trials, there's a conflict of interest there. They're going to game the system to get the answers that they want. Okay. And you know, Conflict of interest is a thing I'm not a big kind of fan of in that I've worked close with all of the major pharmaceutical companies and things like that. So I'm the kind of person, because of my links to industry and things like that, you would think I'd have a biased point of view. Just by, the, I mean, if you're saying just because I've worked with industry, my point of view has to be biased, then I'd say to you, well, show me, okay? I mean, listen to the things I'm saying and tell me if you think the fact that I've been close to industry is causing me to say the things that I've said, okay? And so my point of view would be, there's loads of experts there who are paid by industry, you know, they give talks at meetings, and you can think that they've got a conflict of interest, but unless you can see the data from the clinical trials they're talking about, you can't know for sure. It's when you see the data and have a look at it and those people are actually committing suicide in this trial, and the expert is saying, oh, this drug was wonderfully safe, then you begin to think, well, actually, the money he's being paid may be kind of shaping his view, right? So I, I guess me, I just have like a more basic question. Like, I literally don't understand the architecture of the study. Like, who designs the study? What are their... Do they have conflicts of interest? Do the people who are analyzing the study have conflicts of interest? Or is it all just publicly available or is somebody at the FDA analyzing the data with no buy like with no industry you know well, okay. biases they're all great questions but i want to skip over them and oh, take come it on. To, to a deeper <laughs> question that is going to give you an even bigger problem all right okay which is the FDA stands for the food and drugs agency they regulate food and drugs they regulate butter and chocolate and antidepressants. And in terms of regulating chocolate, it's what's the percentage of cocoa in this? If you don't have a particular percentage, you can't call this chocolate. Butter, it's the same thing. If there's a particular kind of fat and if it's not in there, well, it's not butter. It may be yellow. It might look like butter. But if uh, the right fats aren't in there, then we're not going to let you call it butter. With an antidepressant, they're doing the same thing. It's an assay system. We aren't actually getting you to prove your drug works as an antidepressant. We're simply getting you to show that on a rating scale, the rating scale score falls while you're on the antidepressant. Mm. Okay, And it doesn't have to fall far. It just has to fall a little bit for us to let you use the word. Now, FDA when they regulate chocolate, don't say this is good chocolate. When they regulate butter, they don't say this is good butter. <laughs> With an antidepressant, they're not saying antidepressants are good for you or this is a good antidepressant. It could be weaker than the older ones. The FDA aren't saying that. The FDA have a criterion. It's not just that the rating scale score falls a little bit, but you've just got to have two trials. And they're better called assays. It's a bit like butter. You assay the butter to see does it have a particular percentage of fat. In the same way, you're doing what our industry are doing is assays to see if in two trials, well, two assays, that the score on the rating scale falls a little bit. And if that happens, FDA can say you can use the word, even in, if in fact you've done 100 trials, and you've only shown the drop you want in two of those. The other 98 are 
negative. I mean, nobody ever actually does 98 trials, though. Like, I've heard of conditions where they do three or they do four trials, and so it's like a 50-50 thing. Like, um, we have uh, Michael Sekaris, uh coming on the show a little bit down the line, and he was actually on the FDA panel for uh, removing the accelerated approval for breast cancer drug... Avastin. Avastin, yeah. So basically, Avastin was approved for breast cancer treatment, and uh, Genentech made big promises about the fact that it was going to cure people, and then when they did a larger clinical trial, it turned out that it actually didn't cure people. People actually got sicker, and it seemed like the drug was more poisonous than than actually extending quality of life. Or not only that, but... Uh, you know, they used a weird endpoint inside of it, which was like progress-free survival versus actual extension of life. And so it turns out that the way that Genentech was measuring it, they had, you know, three more months of progress-free survival, but everybody died at the same time point. Mm-hmm. And so I, I've definitely heard cases where you have three trials and two of them have an effect and one doesn't, but I've never heard a case where there's a hundred trials, and only two of them have an effect. Well, the situation with the SSRIs, uh, Prozac, Zoloft, is that there were more negative trials than positive. In the case of Zoloft, there was one and a half trials positive. Uh, The standard is two, uh, and the other four and a half of the six done were negative. So how does a drug pass, then? Well, this is, I mean, FDA, they're saying that, uh, I mean, what this, what they essentially said in the case of Zoloft was, well, we know SSRIs work and you've almost got to. In the case of the antidepressants for children. Uh, That's they, a grim sentence. Yeah. In <laughs> the, the case depressed? of, <laughs> anyway, the just... li- well, when, when they began doing trials of the SSRIs in kids, they couldn't find kids who were depressed. Okay, there just weren't any kids who depressed. It took a long time to recruit kids to the trials. The the paroxetine trials in kids, they did three trials in kids who were depressed, all negative, and FDA approved the drug for children. Now, it's not currently licensed because a big fuss blew up. Uh, It became clear there was a document, an internal GlaxoSmithKline document said we recognize that our trials haven't shown our drug works. And they told FDA that our trials haven't shown our drug works. And FDA right back to them said, we're happy to approve this drug. We agree with you the trials haven't shown the drug works. And we also agree with you that we shouldn't mention this to anyone. Wait, so this was, this was memos between GSK and the FDA? When, FDA, when GSK are trying to get the drug approved, they write to FDA and say, here are our trials. FDA responds saying, no, we can't approve it. Or in this case, yes, we're happy to approve the drug, even though the trials are negative. And what they were saying was, well, we know these drugs work. In your trials, you haven't shown that they worked for kids, but we're just going to assume that they work. And okay, so Now, it's also probably worth saying that in the case of all the trials done with the antidepressants in kids, including the trials done for Prozac, FDA said these trials are negative, but we're happy to approve the drug because we know it works. Now, one of the interesting things here is this. One of the reasons GlaxoSmithKline might be able to persuade FDA to do this was a year before they sent their trials into FDA, they had published the major trial, the lead trial, in a big-name journal with 24 authors on it. And the article said this drug works wonderfully well and is safe. When the document came to light showing the, the internal company document came to light showing that the company knew the drug didn't work and wasn't safe, but they were going to pick out the good bits of the data and publish those, which is the article that I just told you about, the company got sued for fraud. So if the company has an article out there saying the drug works well and the FDA don't approve it or approve it and mention in the label of the drug, well, the trials on this drug in kids just didn't work, that's going to cause the company to get sued for fraud, which is a good reason why FDA are going to agree to your drug being approved even if you haven't been able to show it worked and are not in the business. It's not FDA's job to police the medical 
literature. I mean, you might ask the question. It's a good question to ask. Whose job is it to police the medical literature? It, FDA are clear that is not their job. It's a bit like butter and chocolate. Once they've approved the chocolate, what Hershey's do in terms of marketing, say, eat this and you'll go to heaven, you know. Do they, do they have FDA, anything to do with the design of the trials it's themselves? No. They're just, um, they don't actually design, no. They simply say, I mean, they agree with uh, uh, the company. What's the standard we're going to hold you to? And in the case of the SSRIs, it's a terribly minimal uh, kind of standard. Like, if you're asking the average person in uh, at the street, what do you think an antidepressant that works should do? Well, the first thing you'd probably say is that, well, more people should live if they're taking the antidepressant than if they're not taking one. You'd expect, because it's an awful illness that causes people to commit suicide, that, uh, you know, the placebo... You think, you think that would be box number one on every single medicine? Yeah, but in the case of the antidepressant trials, more people die and more people commit suicide on the drug than on the placebo. And the next thing people would say is, well, we hope it will get people back to work. But, you know, there's no evidence that these drugs get people back to work. The only ev- what FDA, for working for FDA and working for uh, the company means that there's a very small drop on a rating scale. Like a self-reported state of how depressed are you? Not self-reported. No, it's me asking the questions. It'd be great if there was a self-reported scale there as well. Uh, but there's no trials where both me asking the questions and you asking yourself the questions where any of these drugs have been shown to work on both at the same time. I mean, so we know that this stuff happens. Like you have it with uh, like the Vax scandal, right? They they prescribe mm-hmm. a drug that they give to hundreds of thousands of people. They think that 40,000 people died from side effects, Mm -hmm. uh, cardiovascular side effects induced directly by the drug. Uh, Later trial shows that manufacturers of Vioxx, which I think was Merck, knew that it was going to damage the people that they gave it to, but they gave it anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the attitude externally when you talk to somebody who just off the street is like, well, that's, that's, that's an outlier. That's a, that's a one-off that was not typical for what the pharmaceutical companies do. And it sounds like what you're saying is that that's actually very much the status quo for how they're operating. Yes. That, um, in essence, most of the medical literature, like the study 329 article, the one that I told you about GSK, uh, most of the medical literature is like that. It's essentially fraudulent. Okay? Um, and, uh, well, How so? fraudulent yeah. is a bit strong in the sense of to prove fraud, you've got to have an internal company document showing the yeah, let's, way. Let's, 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 not, let's not get ourselves yeah. uh, sued for, what is it, libel? No, no. <laughs> Showing that people went out of the way, they knew that, that that they were doing wrong. But essentially, it's standard operating procedure for the company when they run these assays to pick the good bits out and publish those and give you the impression that this is what happened in the assay. When you know it's it's this, I give you a good example, which in one of uh, you know the Pfizer trials, you can see that in the assay that was done that um, one person died on their drug. And you sort of say, well, um, accidents can happen, you know, that uh, um, uh, this guy happened to die from burns, but in fact, he'd poured petrol on himself, set fire to it, intending to kill himself, and only died five days later, and was coded as burns rather than suicide. So (laughs) when you see that there was a death by... I mean, things happen in life, you know, when you see that there's a death by burns in uh, the trial, unless you get access to the data behind it, you don't know what the real story is. And the data means either the person... uh, Now, if the person's dead, it means their husband or their wife or their kids or whatever who can tell you what happened. But nobody's names are on these things. FDA never go back and interview the family or dig into things like this. They're just looking... Was there two trials in which this drug beat placebo? And beyond that, they don't investigate. What's the solution? Well, when all this was put in place, everybody regarded FDA as bureaucrats, okay? And they didn't expect them particularly to keep you safe. They wanted a 
procedure that you know where people could go through and tick boxes before letting things on the market. The assumption 50 years ago was doctors were people, while there might be some rogue doctors, most of them, if you were harmed by a drug, they'd be completely horrified and they'd write it up and they'd make a fuss about it. And doctors were going to keep us safe. Mm. They haven't been doing that. They're, uh, you know, it's, um, they're awfully comfortable with the very comfortable life they have been paid a lot of money and nobody else can prescribe these drugs other than them. So they're not in the business of saying, well, these drugs aren't wonderful and marvelous. They've let most of the public slip into the point of view of the magic lies in the pills, when in fact, the magic should lie in the interaction between me and you. If you bring a problem to me and let me know roughly what kind of answer you want, we have a discussion about it and I can say, well, there's this option, but it comes with those drawbacks and this option, but it comes with those drawbacks. You know, we work out what to do. That's where the magic should lie in the interaction between us. But we've got this idea that it lies in the pills. Is that a uh, pedagogical issue? Is this like training or is this a fact that doctors don't have any time? Like I've had some really unfortunate interactions with doctors this last year. And I feel like when I, I talk to them, like, I feel like every time I go to the doctor, I need to bring literature with me and yeah. be like, this is what's going on with me. And this is definitely what needs to happen. And that always works out. But short of doing that, I feel like they don't, they haven't even looked at the, the recent yeah. work. They're reciting something that they learned maybe 20 years ago in med school or in residency mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that that could be addressed through the educational pipeline or is there something oh. bigger going on? Yeah, there's a few things going on. One is we want, we all of us tend to want a father figure. Mm. Now the doctor was that, but it's now FDA. People think FDA are you know, the father figure who are going to keep us safe. They don't realize that FDA are a bunch of bureaucrats, that if there's doctors in there, they're in there because they don't like meeting people. If you report a problem to them on an oral contraceptive, well, they may never have worked in that area. They worked in orth orthopedic surgery. You know, what are they going to know about an oral contraceptive problem? Okay. So, um, the, we, we need to get back to figuring that these things aren't safe. We can bring good out of them, but it's not by listening to FDA. Uh, it's by the interaction between a doctor and you. And the reason doctors don't, I mean, they used to listen to you. It used to be, you know, well. It, is, it, is it possible it, to make a father figure for the doctors? So that the doctors have somebody to listen to, like you have is to it, be your own father yeah. figure. No, like, I get it's it. 20... But people need the <laughs> no, father but... figure. You know, this is the point. Doctors who meet you, who see the problem happening right in front of them, who have the chance to interview you, uh, who have the chance to increase the dose of the pill to see what happens, or reduce the dose of the pill and see what happens, call a colleague in and things like that. Between the doctor and you, you're in the best place to be scientific, but Doctors as well are, as you say, looking for a father figure, and they're looking to FDA, not realizing FDA are not meeting you. They're not in a position to examine you. They never will be. And it should be me interviewing you, or you interviewing me, who comes to a view about, well, what's actually happening here. But is, yeah, it, is, it possible, is it possible for there to be some sort of fraternity or I don't know what the proper term for it would be? I mean, it strikes me that what you have to do is you have to educate doctors from a starting point that the advisories for what drugs to give are not established with care and a full context of side effects in mind. Like, I think that it's enough during training to basically tell doctors, look, like, these are things that are a baseline of approval and you have to do the legwork yeah, as like part of your practice. I confused about that. Yeah, well, because I mean, they just, everything... They're like, hey, well, the, the administration says it's fine. Yeah, you hear that a lot where it's like, well, this drug is FDA approved for this or for that, and some people will treat off-label, but I think that there is a sense that if it's but, approved that means that it's safe. And if you push back, they're like, trust the science. What's your problem? And it's like... Yeah, but the issue comes back to what actually is the science. Right, saying, right. The interview between you and me is where the science lies. It's the one place where we have all of the data. 
if you're talking about some trial or assay a company has done where there's no access to the data, FDA haven't seen the data, the article written up about it's fraudulent, even if it's in the very best journals, that's not science. I mean, you know, to be scientific, I mean, when the whole thing began 400 years ago, actually being science was running an experiment in front of people but they could tweak the apparatus to see what happened. But everybody, whatever fate they had, they had to leave that at the door. And they were for forced to come to a, a conclusion based on what they could see right in front of them. Now, we do exactly the same thing in jury trials. You know, you bring evidence into court and you investigate it. You examine people, cross-examine people, sometimes, you know, really push them really hard. And the jury is left to weigh up what they've seen. If you make a claim, somebody else who isn't in court said this about David Healy, that's not let into court. The person who wants to say David Healy is a crank or whatever has to come into court to be cross-examined or that's not evidence. So the only place where something like that happens in the case of clinical care is when the person is in the room with the doctor and they both have a chance to work on well what are we seeing here you know what happens if we increase the dose what happens if we reduce the dose or add an antidote or whatever and you know if they've got a chance to sleep on it and come back and ask the questions again that's what it, the conclusion you come to is objective it may not be the absolute truth it's a bit like any branch of science which is once we come to a view about what we think is happening we can design another experiment and see what happens then and that might change our view and if more evidence comes into court that you know um my wife didn't murder me she was elsewhere then the jury changes their mind <laughs> okay but um it's like they need a way, though, right, to share those perspectives. That's the trick. Those doctors have to be in communication somehow. Well, not only the doc I mean, you can imagine a doctor's office where there's a couple of doctors and they're sharing observations. That's often the case, right? You're, you, there, it's rare that you have a doctor that is just completely isolated and operating. Mm, but in amongst institutions and so forth. But what I'm, I think that that's true, too. And technically, they have journalists for that. But I'm looking... Um, in the United States, most doctors, you know, this is a very cursory search, 10 to 20 patients a day. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is you're not seeing the same 10 to 20 patients. That's what I it mean. It used to be a family doctor, you saw the same person each time. Exactly. And you could build up a relationship over a period of time. Now, I mean, you know, I again and again get cases. I can think of one um young lady that comes to mind where she was just shy and she went along to the doctor and things like that uh, for whatever reason and he was wise and he said look you know there aren't any pills that you should take for this you're just fine some people are shy others aren't you know you find the right niche for you in life rather than trying to be the perfect person uh, but then she went back um, a few months later for a completely different issue and some uh, she saw a completely different doctor who said oh well we can try this pill on you and uh, she had a very bad reaction to it and ultimately ended up in a mental hospital, be labeled as having schizophrenia when she didn't have it. It was a case of getting out of hospital, halting all her pills, and she was fine. But the system will still not believe that she's fine once she's off the pills. It will still think of her uh, as having schizophrenia, and she should be on these pills. And in the case of her family... The only option was to emigrate. It, it, um, why, why was the only option to emigrate? Just to well, you her can't record. persuade people that was. I mean, you can't obliterate what's put in the record. When when doctors make a mistake and diagnose you as having a more severe illness than, I mean, having an illness that you don't have, they don't change their mind. They don't go back and say, I made a mistake. The person's off the drugs, they're back to normal. It was clearly the pills that caused it. You are left with a mental illness record, which is going to influence the opinion of the next person that gets to see you. And maybe your insurance. Yeah, probably your insurance. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so what percentage of physicians are aware of these problems and are dealing with them versus the percentage that are perfectly happy to prescribe whatever the pharma reps bring them every month? No doctor gets trained in how to establish. No doctor these days gets trained in how to establish whether a drug is causing a problem or not. 
And what would that training look like? Like, I mean, I guess it's kind of what you said already, which is that Mm. you learn how to do this sort of evidence-based treatment where you give somebody something and then you check how it, how it develops. But for example, if you look at young people, you have a family doctor until you're probably about 17, 18. Then you leave the house for college. You're probably going to student health services. If you're not switching insurances. If you're not switching insurances because your parents are switching jobs and they're Mm -hmm. they're shuffling you around, right? You'd be quite lucky to have the same position that whole time. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, And then once you leave college, you're probably going to move a couple of times. You're probably going to have different doctors each time you move. If you're inside of a, a healthcare system like... The one that we have here for, you know, it took almost a year to get established with actually like a primary care physician. Before that, you were just going to the walk-in clinic if you needed something. Mm -hmm. And that's Mm -hmm. somebody different every time. And I'm sure that they keep records, but it's not like they're able to follow you over the course of a treatment. And so it just seems like the way that people live now with the way that they move and the way that insurance is maintained through jobs, that there's not the opportunity for people to continuously see the same, even if the physicians were perfect. Mm-hmm. the patients are moving around so much that they're not seeing the same physicians over and over mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. And what do you do yeah. about that? Well, it's worse than that again, which is, as you say, they're moving around, and you're moving around from system to system. And it was in the 1980s, probably maybe at the 1990s, that our health systems changed and began to get managed, just like other service industries get managed. And the managers have no background in healthcare. They may have rotated in from oil or tobacco or whatever, okay? But their their job is to just run the system. And they figure, well, we've got the guidelines here that have been written up by the APA or the AMA or A whatever A. And um, they say, well, the guidelines say these drugs work wonderfully well and there's no mention of any hazards or our problems here, um, you know, and uh, we just want our doctors to adhere to the guidelines. And also the guidelines say, the articles that go with them say that even if it's a new and expensive drug, you're going to save money with it because it's so good. You know, the companies are quite good, a bit like modeling uh, a, a pandemic. They can model how the drug will be used and all of the benefits and how the organization is going to save money. Okay, they aren't going to save money, but you know, there's stuff that's handed to people who run health systems these days. And before, up to the 1980s, the administrators helped, you know, the payroll, they helped organize this stuff, and they helped organize interviews to recruit healthcare staff and things like that. But the discretion that a doctor could exercise saying, look, I think this drug hasn't helped this person. We're not going to use, we're going to have to use a a different thing. Ah, that a nurse had. These were things that were valued. The administrator didn't think he or she knew how to do healthcare any better than uh, the doctor or nurse does, but the managers now think they do. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get people to keep to the guidelines and they've got no background in this. And if I figure rather than... um, just keep giving you the latest fashionable drugs that these things aren't suiting you and we need to think of a completely different thing for you. The system's not going to be sympathetic to that. It's going to be like, it's increasingly like Pizza Hut. You can have the pizzas that are on the recipe. You cannot ask in the middle of Pizza Hut for something or something else that isn't currently there to be added to the pizza that you're getting and that's the way healthcare i mean that's how it's become it's very much a health service industry rather than what it used to be which was healthcare. i mean okay so the way back from that it seems the same way back from the way that academia has been destroyed by bureaucratic bloat it's to take the systems out of the hands of administrators and Mm -hmm. what that so what is the role of the administrators because what comes to mind for me is 
Um, I know that different hospital systems are on different record keeping systems. And so you can get information on your patient from one hospital system, but not necessarily from another hospital system because everything is like proprietary files that you might not be able to open inside of your system. And so that seems like a pretty obvious thing of like a universal standard for all medical records. Mm -hmm. But then what do you do to what are these people who are managing care actually doing? They're telling the doctors what they can and can't prescribe. Yeah, and um, it's to some extent we need to stop thinking of health as a service industry that can be put into a system. Um, we've got to work out how to go backwards and um, introduce a recognition that there's variation among people that has to be taken into account. We can't just treat everybody as you're the same, that they get all they all get the you're the same kind of treatment. We need to recognize that there are huge variations and it needs skilled staff uh, to do that. Now, one of I mean, in terms of how we change the system, if I owned obviously, if I had a vast fortune like Jeff Bezos or whatever and could run the healthcare, everything would be just perfect. Okay. I'd hire skilled people <laughs> course, and tell them to, you know, um, you know, that we do value your point of view. But I mean, key to all this isn't just that you value the point of view of someone like me, say, because when you come along to me, you might find for whatever reason that things aren't working. You, you need to be able to go to a different person. OK, uh, you need to be able to find one that you can work with. OK, and part of the thing we need to recognize as well is not just useful to have skilled staff. We're in a world where someone like you, if you're ill, can access the Internet and end up telling me things about the serotonin system that I didn't know. OK, even though I, I have a PhD in it. So it should be a much more cooperative thing. I mean, we have the opportunity for things to be a much more cooperative thing mm -hmm. and maybe we need to reinvent in healthcare a thing that was fairly big in the uk i don't know if it ever happened in um uh at the united states there was a thing that would lay in between the conservative party the republican party and the democrat or labor party in the uk which is called the cooperative party it was um cooperatives that may be created by people who had a bit of money to help create them but the um, uh, the workers in it became co-owners and they had the motivation to make sure that everything really worked better than average. They weren't just doing the job for for the man, okay? And that's really the kind of thing we need in healthcare. We need probably health cooperatives rather than big health corporations. It seems like there's a couple of barriers to that, namely that people can't penetrate the literature. But I will, however, before you go into all the problems with it, say that health cooperatives are an absolutely fantastic idea. And oh, I think yes. that more worker ownership <laughs> a, across the board yes, is fantastic. I'm all right. sorry. Yeah, I should have with, acknowledged that. With the that. problems. Well, no, I just, I wonder how to, how to, like, we have this big dream that one day there will be some equivalent of Wikipedia for scientific literature that people can literally surf through articles and they can be, the conclusion section can actually be updated by other people than the ones who are doing the study. And I think that we need that sort of interface before the public is going to be able to really productively contribute because, of course, like some PhDs or whatever can bring literature to their doctor, but... I think that there's also regular uh, people that are able to do so, and there's tons of stories of people that are in these support groups, and lots of people who are not PhDs have the capacity I mean, to the, parse difficult literature. Yeah. You don't need to be a PhD. I, I was terrified the no first time I tried to read a scientific paper. Sure, but yeah. when you're sick yeah. and you're yeah. convinced that nobody's going to help you, you figure it out real fast. Like, there's if tons of If you've got skin in the game... And tons who don't, I probably. Mean, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, um, the way I'd be inclined to phrase it, if, if you've got skin in the game, you can really work these things out. Motivation is worth more than expertise. Mm, I, love that. I, I think that's, I mean, I think that what you're saying is also true, that there's a lot of the literature that is inaccessible and you have to have, You. it seems like right now the only people that are doing their own research, so to speak, are they're almost looked down upon. Like you go to a doctor's office and um, there's signs that are like, 
my medical degree is better than Google. Or it's like, oh yeah, did Dr. Google tell you that? There are these like kitschy little signs about like, don't be so stupid as to look things up on Google. And it's like, that's the kind of attitude where I'm like, how do you possibly think that you're the expert in this, that you don't want your patients to come in with things that they've read about and that they've looked at because they know themselves better than you. And so... The literature wiki would be great for them too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know doctors that I've dealt with recently who haven't, looked at the literature because they don't have time that, yeah or, the, or they just say hey i trust the administration you know they know what's up there i'm doing what they advise me to do i mean like i have a phd and i would love to have a literature wiki that basically <laughs> yeah. it's good for everybody as i'm saying right because yeah. sometimes you look at like very very detailed mechanistic papers and um or, one moment excuse us one second we'll edit <laughs> okay. this out we're, we're uh we're still waiting in the mail on a plug for our camera, so we're on batteries. We're going to have to swap the battery out really quickly. Okay. Hold that thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for being patient. Sorry. No problem. We, I meant to uh, actually remind you before we started that this was almost certainly going to happen. Mm. Yeah, do you have to run? How much time do you have? Oh, I'm fine. I'm, okay. I'm good, yeah. Okay, okay. Are you, are you having a good time? <laughs> Yeah, things um, things are actually going well. Okay, okay, okay. Very good. Uh, five seconds. There we go. All right, we're back. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, looks fine. Let me just check this other angle. Oh, it's gone again. I lost this angle. This camera is off the crap. Something's happened. It's fine, I think. Nope. <laughs> yep, back That's, again. Oh, uh, sorry. Go! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Got it's gone. gone. It's gone. All right, we've lost one of our cameras permanently. Better luck next time. Indeed. Um, where were we? What I was saying is that the you you dig into the literature sometimes, and it genuinely feels like the goal of the literature is to be difficult to parse. Like, scientists don't write for each other in a way where what they really want to do is they want to make their paper really readable and really easy to understand. And I catch people like this where if there's the option of switching into jargon, they'll almost always switch into jargon because we carry so much weight of, you know, how intelligent we sound when we speak about science. And so when you're writing a scientific paper, it almost seems like you're induced by the form to speak in these roundabout complicated ways where you bury the lead. You see it in any professional circle. Like if you hang out with lawyers too much too, you see this also where it's like, you could have said that in a much simpler fashion if you really want, but there's this importance of demonstrating that you're in the know. And I think it's subliminal. It's not like just people being jerks. Yeah. And so I, I just, I think that there does need to be a dramatic simplification of of the scientific literature well, with... uh, uh, go ahead hang on a second hold on yeah no no my experience is that you can as i say when people are motivated and this is particularly women looking after children or women looking after parents or whatever and they get to grips with an issue they tackle some pretty uh, intense stuff and make sense of it like you know uh, the story in shipwreck of the lady who worked out that SS rise actually caused you to become alcoholic. She didn't have any background in healthcare. I mentioned earlier that um, nicotine can be good for OCD. Well, I didn't learn that from the literature. I learned that from one of my patients who worked it out for himself in terms of what was happening to him. He His OCD got a lot worse when he stopped smoking. Mm-hmm. And, you know, having tried loads of pills, which didn't help him, he went back to smoking and the OCD cleared up. And he then checked the literature. He went and investigated it and found, well, actually, there are clinical trials showing nicotine works well for OCD, just as well as SSRI. So, again, this is people telling me things. And one of the current issues, the one that I mentioned, was that people, when they go on an SSRI and stop, they may find themselves unable to make love at all. And this may remain permanent. Okay. Now, working with a group of people that have this problem, it's them who are 
Uh, and there's a bunch who've got PhDs and things like that, but it's not necessarily the PhDs that come up with the answer. The ones who've been trained to read the literature, there's a load of them who have no background in these things, who somehow, and I don't know how people do it, manage to work their way through things and spot leads, which could be interesting and helpful, that have really, they've been the one who've, who've made all of the running in terms of the research on this condition, trying to work out what's causing it, how it happens, and what might help. So, you know, it. I mean, you've got an option as a doctor to have all these people, awkward people, you know, like Mike, who comes along with all the literature and says, you know, hey, doc, you know, I've got this problem. Uh, that's not easy for a doctor to cope with. It's not fun. It's not nice to have awkward patients. Uh, but yeah. unless Amy. you switch, unless, well, unless you switch your mindset and say, hey, I don't have 100 awkward patients. I've got a hundred free research assistants. You know, I should be working with you. I can make a little contribution. People come in with some really good ideas. I can say, yeah, that's good. And every so often, the things of the options they offer me, there's some that I can say, well, I've heard that before and it just didn't work out. Or that's not particularly sensible. So I can offer a little bit of, 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 of steering, you know, but Again, it needs to be done in, uh, in a way where, you know, I've I've heard all this a lot, so I can maybe steer a little, rather than me thinking, well, I really know what's going on and people should be listening to me. It, it, it should be much more cooperative. Abandoning the cult of the expert is a pretty hard bargain to strike, though, because I think that people go into something like medicine or law or whatever other vaunted professions we have because they want to be the ones in possession of the knowledge and our entire our entire social structure is based on the idea that there's a gilding process which authorizes you to be the one who is in possession of the knowledge and you are the one who dispenses the knowledge and you are singular and if you start to open that up and be like, well, hey, you don't need, you you can read the literature, you can figure it out, and your opinion is important and it's valuable, it seems to really strike fear in the heart of some people. But the whole point behind science is <laughs> we're proceeding into the unknown. Mm, I love and it. We yeah. only do that if the people in the room figure, well, there isn't anyone here in the room that really knows just what's going on, and we're going to benefit from the awkward people as well who figure out that they don't really buy what I'm saying. So, you know, let's 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 think it through. Well, so the the them that requires us to change the role of medicine in society and the role of science in society. And this is something, this is like one of my favorite dead horses to beat. Science is the process of authoritarianism in our society. That's probably the boldest that I've ever stated it before. But basically, the idea is this. You have a discipline whose purported goal is to discover truth. That discipline is tied deeply into the function of the state because the state needs to be able to say that the things that are, it is doing are correct. And how does it do that? It does so through science. And so the minute that you have government-funded science that is being reflexively used to steer the ship of the government, you end up in a position where you cannot have someone who is outside the edifice of science coming through and being like, hey, I disagree. I think that you're wrong about that because it looks really bad for the government who's supposed to have all of the answers. And if you just have like schlubs off the street that have taught themselves how to read med papers being like, hey, I think the pharmaceutical industry is screwing with people. That is not, it's not kosher. It doesn't. It's not tolerated. It's not tolerated. I mean, it doesn't we've probably, belong yeah, we've probably been thrown off of YouTube already if we're even talking about these things. I mean, we've definitely had interviews Let taken down. the doctor's office. Yeah. But it's like. I just I think that it is so tied into the spirit of what it means to do science that it is part of the state at this point. Yeah, but uh, that's really not science, okay? That's you've you've got a religious belief system there. You're talking about a theocracy rather than what should actually be science, uh, which is a much more cooperative enterprise. Now, I agree with you. States like to have government you know we want to be we want to have people to steer things 
it's a bit of a myth, though, that we're steering on the basis of, uh, you, you know, the science. That's what people say. They like to invoke science, a bit like they used to invoke God, you know. Um, but we need to get away from that and maybe get back to invoking God, <laughs> trusting him or her, but letting, uh, you know, the scientists be... Well, even then, this, the damn priest class is going to get in the way of the God thing, too, just like they get in the way of the... I mean, this is a very... Well, yes. No, no, sure. Yeah. You're right. No, no. Uh, sure. Uh, Absolutely. I'm with you completely on that one. And that's what needs to be changed. That we've got um, you're the scientific experts and doctors in particular who are a priestly class these days, rather than, you know, um, people who are working with you to try and get you to the right place. Yeah. And lawyers and politicians, too. It's like this strange slot that always seems to get. I feel like we're at the end of the Mayan civilization or something. We're like, get the priests. It's the priests. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You're going to start burning down that building. Um, and also, this whole thing, like you didn't totally touch on this, but it seems like there's uh, there's this paradigm of the military industrial complex that um, I believe it was Eisenhower warned, or was it Truman? God, Eisenhower, uh, yeah. Eisenhower warned yeah. the American people famously about, and that's kind of played out over the last fifty years or so. Most of the wars, at least that our country has fought, have accomplished relatively little, other than making a lot of money for certain people. Um, it seems like there's a similar medical industrial takeover at play here as well. In addition to this, um, this issue with the the priest class that everybody hates but loves at the same time um what can we do to get control over that situation is it um is it a, is it a kind of a thing like with the military industrial complex where we just get so sick of seeing blood like the you know when people were able to go to vietnam and actually be able to to see people getting blown apart they actually got sick of the war and demanded that it stopped and to a certain extent this happened honestly with afghanistan and I, well, iraq's still a, a crater but i wonder if if it's something that you think will fit, heal itself once people start to see the carnage that's coming out of the medical industrial complex as well well what you got to recognize is that um the military and health are closely intertwined. Oh, no. It was only about 100 years ago when the Japanese were at war with the Russians that we had the first war in which less people died from disease than from combat. And the Japanese won the war because they had a better health system than the, the Russians did. You know, up till then, uh, at the American Civil War, which was the, probably the war that did the most to get the military to recognize they needed to look at the issue about what the soldiers were actually dying from, the dysentery and other illnesses. And if they could, could, pe could keep people uh, alive in war, they were more likely to win the war. Okay, so the military have played a great part in the great war world war ii vietnam korea and all these things that i mean a lot of uh, the advances we have particularly uh, to do with surgery have come from war okay so but if you think i mean there's been to a degree this has been good in that um just like you have an arms race and the and um, you know, the military are um, are actually involved in that as well Clearly, because the people who have the best guns and artillery and whatever it is, bombs, are more likely to win. So if you develop good stuff, the other guy has to too, and there's an arms race or whatever. But when we get to the nuclear bomb stage, we reach a point where, well, you know, you can't get more efficacious. We can't use these things because they're too efficacious. In the same way in healthcare, to some extent, we've got there, which is, you know, if you're on more than three drugs per day, you're not going to get the benefit you'd get from three are less. And for people who are on 10 drugs told that each of these things works well, well, each of them may work well on their own, but if you're taking 10, you're going to die earlier. Okay, so we've kind of reached a nuclear bomb point in that we've got great stuff, which we can use, and it's great to have it. And if we're using it in you know, the right place, um, you know, that would be great. But it's a bit like guns. If you've got too many drugs around the place being used by too many people, too much of the time, things are going to go wrong. So there is a point, and this comes back to the point that I think I've been making the whole way through. 
where we get to a point where we need we need people to make judgment calls. We need people to make choices. You know, well, there's these ten drugs I could be on. Which are, if I, ha I mean, you know, which are the three that really count for me in terms of what I want from my life? I mean, the idea of the system should be to help me live the life that I want to live, right? And it may be that I'm living in a place up in the Rockies where it will be handy to have a gun. A gun will help me live the life that I want to live rather than be the food that the bear wants me to be, okay? In the same kind of way, we need to recognize these things are all there for us to live the life we want to live rather than the life Pfizer want us to live. Mm. Pfizer are operating on you know, the basis of introducing rating scales where when you fill them up, their drug's going to be the answer for that, you know, for uh, the score you get on this, this rating scale. So, yeah, the key issue is at some point, people have to recognize that we've got to take control of the apparatus back into our own hands. And, wow, that's, um, that's strangely revolutionary sounding. <laughs> well, well, not strange at all, but yeah, it is. And the trick about how to go, how to go about that is the nuance here. Yeah, do you keep the FDA? Well, again, you're acting like FDA are an important part of things, that they're mm. dad, and we don't want to get rid of dad, we don't want to kill off dad, but FDA weren't ever meant to be that. It really should be. It's it should be more more democratic, you know. It should be more um, consultative operations where you have citizens getting involved and debating key issues like abortion or whatever. You know, what's the right way forward with these kind of things? To some degree, um, but something that the FDA does do is they make sure that there's no diethylene glycol in your your sulfur drugs. You know, it's any time that you start talking about the days before the FDA, you very, very quickly run into a point where people were selling things that were literally filled with poison. Yeah, isn't Mercury, there a... cadmium, lead, antifreeze. Well, there's two answers to that. One is that um, once it becomes clear that diethylene glycol can cause problems, that FDA weren't really the ones that pinned that down, no company can afford to put diethylene glycol in anything after that. Now, FDA can enshrine it in the regulations, okay? But FDA, up till 1962, their business was to ensure these things were safe. Not, I mean, you couldn't put diethylene glycol in it. After 1962, their business was to ensure that things were effective. Now, in terms of hmm. regulation, what was the regulations the for cars or the stock market or whatever is about keeping people safe. It's not telling you this works best. You should invest. I mean, the regulators for you know, at the stock market don't tell you or give you the impression you should invest in these particular stocks. In terms of cars and things like that, you know, we uh, design the system so you're not at undue risk of being killed. We're not. We're not, you know, it's not the point of regulation to make sure we've got the quickest cars on the road. But with drugs, it is a case of uh, ensuring that. What, what uh, happened in 1962? 62 was the thalidomide crisis. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. There's a different way to look at it, which is um, if you take, if you fly from Oregon to New York, um, the pilot on the plane is going to uh, keep an eye out on uh, near miss. If things look like they're going wrong, they're going to say, well, look, you know, uh, they're going to report the near miss and they're going to be heated because the system knows that if they don't heat it and put it right, none of the pilots are going to fly again. Partly because if you don't get to New York, well, what do you know? The pilot doesn't get there either. But in terms of Doctors, if there's a near miss, they see a problem, there's a hazard and things like that. The regulators know that if you die, the doctor doesn't die. She flies on just the same. And that's the difference. I mean, we need to, uh, doctors need to be scrutinized closely when things go wrong. They need to realize that they've got to keep place in this. They're not just being paid huge amounts of money to dish pills out when you come in and say, look, doc, I'd like to try this pill. So are you suggesting more accountability for doctors? Because, I mean... <laughs> doc, you better try that pill with me. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I think... Yeah, no, 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 sure. Um, I think... 
the people who are really failing you most are are doctors and they risk going out of business you know at the moment they've been paid huge amounts of money but they're increasingly being replaced around the country by nurse practitioners where the system the management figures a nurse can do a, just the same job we're told these drugs work well they're completely safe nurses are cheaper let's get nurses interesting and on some level that makes sense because if you can get more nurses and the nurses end up seeing the patients more frequently and the nurses have it in their minds that they need to be keeping track of how safe the drugs are. No, they'll be keeping to the guidelines. They're not being asked. To, nobody's asking anyone to keep a track on how safe these things are. Nobody, I mean, you can report a near miss, but FDA file it in the filing cabinet they don't look at it they don't investigate it because your name isn't on it mm, there's another dimension of this too which is the nurses themselves like i had a friend that i was in a lab with before i went to grad school and you know everybody's looking around like you can go to grad school med school whatever and my friend was like no nah, i'm gonna go and get my nurse practitioner license i'm gonna be making you know I'm going to make more money than you guys are in the next 10 years before, while you're still making minimum wage and residency. And, you know, the, I don't know what it is, but there doesn't seem to be enough doctors. And it seems like the AMA is perfectly happy with that. And there, it's hard this, to not feel conspiratorial. It's, not, it's just an incentive structure that's kind of like dented, right? I mean... But well, yeah, why not? Why why are there so few doctors? Wouldn't more doctors solve this? No, I don't. Well, as things are uh, at the moment, I think you're getting a less and less. Well, you're getting less and less good value for money from uh, uh, the doctors you have, and increasing the number of doctors is just going to increase the number of pills that you're being dished out, uh, which is going to require more doctors because more people are injured and going into hospital these days. More people are going into hospital from diabetes pills than from diabetes, from hypertension pills than from hypertension, from antidepressants and other psychotropic drugs than from the illnesses that have been used to treat. So it's a system that's spiraling out of control. It's, it, we appear to have less doctors than we need because the doctors that we have are just dishing these things out without thinking. And this seems to be like a medical climate change, right? If you're saying this isn't how it's always been, it's like this thing that's happening. It's like the 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 water is slowly boiling us kind of situation. Mm, yes, exactly. Yeah. And you'd have to think at some point um, a fuse is going to blow. And I think, I mean, my hunch is that the life expectancy data is going to force people to think again. It's the fact that in terms of the replacement rates, you know, uh, 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 the women in the United States are having less babies than are needed to replace the population as is. So between life expectancy falling and us not having enough children, uh, you know, the population is going to fall, which means that the Chinese are going to be able to wipe us out. Do we need this? We don't. How are we going to stop it? Well, ooh, one of the things that might be causing this is we're using too many drugs. So either we stop using them or else we persuade the Chinese to start using a lot more drugs and their population will fall too. <laughs> Based off, well, so actually about the Chinese population, I, I think that the, everything that I've seen suggests that they're well below replacement at this point. Yes, well. yes. Like the yeah, entire sure. world has basically mm. given up the, the game of having children. Well, have, you, have you seen how much yeah. it costs to have a baby? My God. Not only mm -hmm. that, but it's mm -hmm. just like we, we're living in, in just times that it feels like everything's falling I'm, apart. I'm just trying to get the heater on in yes, here, you know? <laughs> God. Child? I mean, yeah. Where does it, so where does this leave us? Uh, with much to think about. I mean, I'm always trying to probe structural ideas for how we can fix this. It's hard for me to not think in terms of regulatory steps that can be added. And yeah, the problem is, yeah, the traditional response on the left is less, let's add more regulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had an interesting uh, experience recently working in a clinic that I was in, which is here, and it's public health funded, uh, you know, so both the left and the right, uh, actually in Ontario, endorse public health funding for the health system, okay? But my experience was that if you want to reduce medication burdens, or if you want to recognize that the drugs could be contributing to the problem the patients had, you are not welcome in the system. 
100 years ago, 50 years ago, it was a privilege of wealth to be able to get treated. It has now become a privilege of wealth to be able to get off treatment. If you're in a public health system, if you're in, I mean, the left have wanted people to get more drugs and to get more treatment. And they still want it at a point where getting more drugs and getting more treatment has become the problem, not the answer to people's problems. I mean, I think that this is, it takes a long time for these sorts of things to shift. And, and I think that you're exactly right, which is that the pendulum has swung and it's gone from people can't get access to good care to the fact that the care is this behemoth that is swallowing them whole. And it's a machine that powers itself. Like I'm, I, I, I tend to have a conspiratorial bent where I'm like, there's someone who's running this. Michael Shiloh is much more. Look, there's just incentive structures that drive people towards this, and there's a huge amount of money being made by all of the players involved as you raise the number of pills that people are on, the number of appointments that they need, the number of procedures that they're getting. There's absolutely nothing in this system that is helping people walk that back and be like, let's detox from, from mm -hmm. all of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. the pharmaceutical companies are interested in it, the medical systems are interested in it, especially if it's the a public health system. The government is interested in it, yep, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, yep. honestly, as you, if you really believe that the government is looking at its own population and is like, we have too many people, which honestly, if you... Subs if you if you look at it from the lens of okay, uh, you used to need a really large workforce for powering the factories and doing the menial labor, and now as you shift away from a mechanical workforce and into the service world, I don't really think that there's a, there's the same sort of incentive for maintaining a really large population, and so now we're getting into this era of well, we don't need to grow our populations anymore, and mm -hmm. so governments are not particularly interested. Not in just having governments, but experts, you know. People People come on the show all the time, especially people when they're like really pushing this climate change business. A lot of their sentiment also folds into this depopulating idea. Yeah, there's like there's a weird thread of eugenics that runs throughout all well, of yeah, this. Yeah, they're not talking about them not having children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like people like me should have children, but like the 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 nobody the hoi polloi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Right, and so there's this like weird thread of that that runs through this entire thing. Where my conspiratorial bent is like. I don't think the governments are interested in you living longer. Like, I, I think that it's really gotten to the point where it's like there's going to be a group of people that have access to longevity and cellular restoration and anti-aging stuff, and it's probably going to work because they'll be able to buy their way out of treatment that doesn't work. And then everybody else is just going to go to the grave and life expectancy is going to go back down to like 40 or something. Mm-hmm. Like that just that seems. Well, I'm less <laughs> the doomer perspective over here. Yeah. I'm I'm more 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 cock up and at the incentives we've put the wrong ones in place and uh, you know, but the incentive. I mean, it's regulation adding more isn't uh, the answer. I think it's somehow getting more cooperative, people taking a bit more control back into their own hands and more responsibility for the things that happen. You know that. Uh, this treatment isn't working out. Uh, you know, we need to walk it back, uh, as you say. Um, That's only really possible if people have the freedom to make those choices too, which I think is worth mm. mentioning. Um, mm. To the extent that we surrender our ability to access information, that we agree to censorship and that we agree to a top-down control over our health care system, we're really giving up our ability to even participate in that process. And I think we have to be really careful to not let those sort of controls creep in because the, the problem that I see beyond this discussion as the central problem of our civilization is that a corporation is essentially an algorithm and we've essentially let our governments been being driven by these algorithms, which are designed for growth. That's all they can really factor in. Um, you have index funds that are managing your retirement. They operate autonomously. You're going to invest in whatever companies are growing the best. And that's just how it works. Those companies have the ability to buy off, well, that's maybe too extreme, but to influence legislation at an ex to a pretty extreme degree. And at this point, a government that was literally some the slogan was by the people for the people is, is sort of 
for the numbers at this point. Yes. And uh, until we solve that problem, uh, I don't know that we'll be able to take control over all of these, these sub-issues. Um, I don't know how to solve that problem, but I hope that somebody who's listening has figured it out. <laughs> I think that worker ownership is, it's something that we've talked about a lot. It's something that we've we've seen in practice. Like after we finished grad school, we actually traveled around the country and we went to as many worker-owned businesses as we could. And we did interviews with the people who were working there. Um, we had no idea what we were doing. And so all of the footage is garbage. But we had a lot of really good conversations with people who are working in industries that like... Huge industries. We went to this robotics manufacturing country company that was making uh, assembly machines for... I think that Tesla almost contracted them for something. Like these are engineering mm. firms and mm. they're owned mm. by the workers. And mm. it's not some like crunchy granola hippie shop that we went to lots of those too. Mm. Like it is a viable form of business for people who want control over the runaway incentive structures. It's a very simple fix for the problem in a way because it basically says, hey, if you don't actually work here, you don't get stock in the company. It's like, whoa. And then all of a sudden, the humans are making human decisions for their own workplace and for their products and for their backyards. And it's a very compelling argument. And I think it gets swept into this like communist socialist bin a lot, but it has nothing to do with either one of those ideas. It's a, yep. it's a really democratic, incredibly liberating idea that um, mm -hmm. I think people should investigate more in their own businesses. Mm -hmm. I think the core, I mean, uh, the core, just to pick out a few of the things you've both been saying, uh, and I think healthcare is a very good place to look at where things go wrong. You know, we're now treating numbers rather than treating people. You know, I treat your blood pressure numbers, I treat your peak flow rates, I treat your uh, mood scores rather than treating you. And it's very much a case of getting back to something much more cooperative, which treats, which involves people liaising uh, 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 together to help us all live the lives that we want to live rather than the lives the market wants us to live. Yeah, and that is the problem of our times. And... God damn it, we're going to figure it out on this show. <laughs> yes, one way or another. I mean, um, I think that this is this has been really interesting. There's a lot here to think about. Uh, we have more conversations that are in the pipes about the, the way that the pharmaceutical companies are influencing medicine and the FDA and safety and health and everything else. Yes, yeah, so everybody is listening. We're going to have a, a dude who's working with the FDA come on um, very soon and give us a different perspective. Although he's also very... He's, he's written a, a very different book than yours, but it's also quietly... Uh, <laughs> yeah, like he's, miss, he yeah. seems like more supportive of the idea of the FDA because he's like, look, there are people that need to be in the room who are looking to see if the data from the clinical trial is what they say it is. Mm -hmm. But he's also like, the system is quite broken. But he says it quietly, right? Because he works with the FDA. So, so we're going to keep, we're gonna keep <laughs> studying this and maybe... Well, um, it, after you interview him, if you want to come back and ask me some Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be awesome. Great. There's loads of things we haven't touched on that I can give you, you know, nitty gritty kind of examples about like when my ghostwritten article turned up for me. You know, I was asked to get involved in a meeting and the next email after I said yes was, well, and here's your article. You know, there's a lot of stuff I can tell you that most people don't know about and would be totally shocked about man we get those we get emails all the time like people are like mm -hmm. different companies selling stuff are like hey can we just slip an article onto your blog it'll look like you mm -hmm. wrote it mm -hmm. we're like mm -hmm. what the, what no <laughs> what are like, you talking yeah, about no. but it isn't yeah. just that it's the new england journal of oh yeah no, no i'm sure i'm yeah. sure i'm sure it gets much much worse yeah mm -hmm. but yeah we would love to have you come back after we've yep. uh, studied this a few maybe we'll get a few different people together and yeah. maybe who knows we'll even get a round table together one day so, yep. yeah, thank you, Dr. Healy. This has been uh, David, illuminating. It's fine. Oh. Yeah. All right, David. Okay. Thank yeah, you thanks so much. for coming Bye. by. Yeah, no, it's been fun. All thanks right. for asking me, and hopefully, we'll be able to hook, we'll be able to hook up again in the not too distant future. Yeah, okay. love it. I'll see you soon. Thank okay. you, sir. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.